Sure. What's up, Warriors, and welcome to another Mental Health Movement podcast. I am your host, Chris. Today, I have a very special guest. He had reached out to me on Facebook, wanted to share his story. He is a fellow warrior, and he is also a fellow podcaster. He is the host of Maddie C Sports for You and Me. Matt, how you doing, man? Good. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I, I greatly appreciate uh you know you reaching out and wanting to come on here and share your story with us. Uh, it's a big step that not a lot of people want to take, you know. So I'm happy to have you on here. Appreciate you having me. Of course, man. Um, so let's let's before we uh you know get into the questions and everything. What made you want to share your story now? Was it just you were tired of holding it in or where where did the the want to share come from? So what happened was, um, yeah, it's basically what you said. Uh, it was just something I held in for a long time. And it's really seeing other people like not particularly famous or anything like that, people telling their stories and telling um, different aspects of their life that nobody ever knew because it's like there's so many stigmas that like if I say I tell my story that you know it's just gonna bottle you up inside so for me I never took that as a as an attack and it was just I was waiting for the right time to say it to get to get my head into the space I needed to, to, to speak about it. So yeah. that's why I'm here. Well, that's, that's good, man. I'm glad, uh, glad you found that inner strength within yourself to, to want to do this. I, I remember when I first started telling my story, I was in a really bad head space, you know, kind of, I don't want to say it was a, a bad way to express everything that was going on, but it was, I needed to get it off my chest. I needed to, get it out of my mind because it was driving me crazy. And, you know, obviously that's way before this podcast and the group. So like you said, the stigma, man, sharing your story, there's a giant stigma around mental health still to this day that it's hard for us to even begin to want to share what's going on in our life. So I totally understand. Um, so let's, uh, let's start from the beginning. You had said you were 13 when you were first diagnosed with depression. Do you remember that day at all? And did a certain event uh, kind of set something off in your brain to, I guess, look for that diagnosis? So the diagnosis actually was that I was bipolar depression, which in case, which in the case I had was not true. I had just depression, wasn't bipolar. But at the time, I was had a lot of anger that wasn't me. I was angry and just would get mad and throw things and get pissed off. And um, yeah, so it was probably about two or three years, believe it or not. Like when you grow older, I feel like you, you remember the time frame of when certain events have happened some don't some do in that case I do with you know it's like you're trying to not really a resume because that's a bad way to say it but you have the when this happened when this happened and when this happened so um that's when that started and um then going into high school it kind of was okay and I was doing um some stupid things like different kinds of drugs and stuff like that. And, um, kind of just numb the pain really. And, um, yeah, so, uh, took me a big lesson to get past that. And I feel like, you know, when you have that, I guess, diagnosis slash label, you know, just kind of like slapped on you, you know, it's got to like stick to the back of your head and just be like, you know, I have this wrong with me and it, and it just, forms that anger inside you like you said and you start self-destructing and you don't know what you're doing with your life because you feel like you have no control over it um Mm -hmm. i remember i I think i was around the same age when i was diagnosed with depression as well and it was at that time in my life where 
uh, you know, I was still processing my parents' divorce. I hated school. I didn't have a lot of friends. So I definitely can um, completely understand how you felt in terms of all that anger and not knowing where to place your emotions at. So being 13, man, that, that's such a tender age uh, mm -hmm. for anybody, mm -hmm. you know? And back then when we were kids, uh, I'm not, how old are you again? Are you, are you my age? I'm 33. Okay. So you're, you're three years older than me. So um, I wouldn't, I know when we were kids, when, if we talked about the things that we were going through, it was like, oh, well, if you feel this way, you're going to go to the institution and you're going to be given all these pills and this and that. So holding on to that label of depression and all the feelings of what you're going through, I'm uh, sure just eats you up inside and just gets, gets mm. worse over time. Um, well, to, to add to that, um, that's, you know, we were talking about stigmas right now. Now, I don't know if you've seen um, Requiem for a Dream before. Yeah. Um, and the mother um, going crazy because she was so into the, the um, um, what were they? Um, weight loss pills. Right. And they, you know, that in my mind frame is like what I felt like being institutionalized was like, if you didn't get that's how you were going to end up. And um, that didn't happen until I got really sick. And that that vision of that particular her going like into electroshock, which if, if people don't know, that's not a it is real life, but it's really not. It's it's not that kind of thing. And that's what that's what the misconception is with mental health. Like they they think you're batshit crazy all the time when in fact you're you're not. Like it it takes a lot to you know tell the story, like I said, but think you can you still hear me yeah okay uh i think you lagged uh towards the end oh i um i was just saying that you know like there's different stig uh stigmas to this and you know you gotta said people gotta stop watching movies and shit and realize that um not all of it's real life happening right yeah exactly and I feel the movies don't do mental health any justice sometimes because, you know, especially especially growing up, there is always that uh, not talk about what you're going through because, the, you know, like you said, the uh, this is what happens if you're feeling like this kind of thing. And like you said, it's not reality. It's there's people that want to help you. But absolutely. You know, I, I'm glad we're in a place now where we can openly talk about this and not have to worry about. Uh, if we're going to get locked up tomorrow because we're sharing, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, so how much of an impact did the abuse that you mentioned to me in your story have on your early adulthood? So, um, as I said, I was drinking and partying. This was probably a year after high school. I got a job at, a, I met a girl from there. And, you know, eventually I said, well, I don't like you. So at that point, she went home and I got a, you know, I said I was uh, not going to see her anymore. So what happened was she said she was going to kill herself. So then the mother told, called me, which I that clicked right at me. And, you know. I couldn't leave my house for like three days. I meant three months. I mean, cause I didn't want to like, it, it just impacted me so badly. So from then on, I, um, you know, then could, coming out of my house, I decided to do more drugs and all that. So it was a tough process. Um, yeah. Like to hear, to hear that you're, 
you know, somebody says they want to kill themselves because you don't want to like, you know, date somebody or anything like that. It was just that click button in your head and you like, you're just like, I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to do anything. And it hurt for a while. And um, yeah, so after that, um, I I went to the drugs again, like drinking and smoking weed and, you know, doing all sorts of stupid drugs. And Thankfully, I never got into the really heavy drugs like heroin or crack or any of that stuff, but it did have a lasting effect. And I don't know if that affected more of my mental health, but we'll never know. It's just right. something you don't know. So that was a that was um, something that hurt me for a short time, um, but I, I got out of it. But that's that's what happened there. Yeah. And, you know, it's. It's amazing when, well, not really, I don't mean to say amazing, like, wow, that's cool. Like, it's amazing to see how the brain reacts to to trauma. You know, we mm-hmm. fall into those coping habits, whether that's healthy coping or, you know, unhealthy coping. And when you finally break out of those unhealthy habits and you start, uh, you know, trying to recover yourself from, you know, all the abuse you suffered, uh, all, all the drug use, all the alcohol, you know, whatever um, that you went through. And you look back and it's like, I don't know how much of a long term effect this is going to have, but you're doing right by yourself now. You know, it's it's yeah. amazing when you you start like learning more about yourself and you start becoming more self-aware of of uh of your surroundings and your your inner self you know and uh honoring your inner child is something that i i always like to say to people because it's something that so many of us as adults completely forget about like you know honoring your inner child means okay what's best for my peace what's best for me and you sharing about your experiences and you uh, trying to do right by not only yourself, but your family and your your peers and friends. So, you know, honoring your inner self is what I feel like the stage that you're at right now. And it's great to see. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, it was something I hid from my friends for so long, like, so doing all the stupid things was kind of like, I'm just going to keep doing drugs and doing stupid shit until it was about 2013 ish when, you know, I got a, uh, what they call an OUI up here opera by getting out of those drugs and getting out of that stupid stuff. So happily I'm not in that party lifestyle anymore. Yeah, that's good, man. Um, so you you mentioned in your story uh, that you have a daughter. Um, yes. When she was born, what was the first thing that you knew that you were going to teach her? Uh, you know, whether that's a life lesson or mental health wise, like, you know, obviously when they're newborn or when they're in the very young ages in their life, you know, it's obviously (laughs) you're not trying to teach them everything so young but what was something that you learned uh, about your experiences that you wanted to make sure that she uh she knew to either i guess avoid making those decisions or how to um make better choices for herself um I would say, first off, I didn't want her to just pick any sport, but soccer and tennis and dance, and then we're good. No, but in all honesty, um, really, the first thing I said is to myself was be there for my daughter. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but don't be how my parents were to me or vice versa. So, um you know, I, I love my daughter very much. She is the reason why most of this, what my journey has been for, if if I, what has, what happened to me in the after effect 
and doing what I had to do all stems to her. She's like my, my blessing. My, the biggest thing in my life is her. And, um, you know, but the doing the things I had to do mentally to, to get my life back together was for her. And if, if I had to do it again, I probably would, even though it was the worst, worst time of my life that that's what I would do. And, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's, there's something that somebody told me and I won't say who, but you gotta do it as the past is depression. The future is anxiety, live in the present. And you really won't have to, you know, have to think of it any other way, which that kind of caught me. I've, I've used that for like, what was the last interview? Like three years ago, I was told that. That's incredible. That wow. So, so what is it again? The past is depression. the The past is depression. The future is anxiety. Live in the present. I love that. That's that's incredible. Because it really makes you think. It's like, wow, I went through that, and it's like, shit. What's gonna happen tomorrow? And oh my god, my mind is blown right now. <laughs> it's a good keep, one. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to have you send that to me just now. I'll forget it. That's that's a great one. Absolutely. Um, that's been the best advice I've had for that. How old's your daughter? She's four now. She's four. Uh, you know, I, I've always said to uh, any of my friends that are parents and that are great parents. Um, it's It's great to see so many people try to break those cycles that they were taught while they were growing up by toxic family members or more importantly their own parents uh you know Mm -hmm. i myself i don't have kids yet but when i do i know what not to do i know what not to say because of how i was treated growing up so you being a 33 year old man who openly talks about mental health for one breaks the cycles that however you were treated by your parents and and knows the right and wrong or you know the right language to uh i guess say to your daughter like you know instead of like screaming or whatever it's just like this is what you did wrong and this is how you can improve so like Mm -hmm. breaking that cycle is probably the most important part of being a parent it's it's really cool to see that you can use what you went through to become a better parent than how your parents may or may not have been Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so one question I wanted to ask on here, I, I try to try to bring into every podcast I've done if I have guests on. And uh, I know you mentioned it in your story to me. Um, how was your inpatient therapy or how was your inpatient hospital visit versus therapy? Because I know some people preferred one experience over another and I know inpatient therapy is basically, you know, for an extreme, you know, like crisis uh, situation. So how was that for you? So this is probably the biggest question you got for me. So um, both honestly work. And that's what it was at the point where um, I told my work, I said, I, I got to go. Like, I just got to go. And I didn't really go anywhere. I just was like, um, this was like, um, this was months in the, in the making. And um, it was turning into, I was crying every day, just overthinking, 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 overthinking. And there was a point where I was just like, I can't, I, I, th- I this is out of my control. Like I can't, I can't do it on my own. So um it was then i um was checked into an inpatient hospital um it was minimum 10 days um probably the craziest uh out of control thing in uh, 10 days i didn't really eat that well um i saw things that are like crazy guys talking to themselves a guy who believe it or not was like needed to make like 
perfect symmetrical triangles and do all sorts of numbers and people um you know uh a guy was trying to kill himself with a plastic knife right next to me when i'm grabbing medicines and um uh then you i i was just so inundated with the with the medicines they gave me and they were the wrong ones so amazingly enough what i found out was i had a it, I was taking all these steps before I went there and they gave me a list of the medicines that are okay. There was green light, yellow, or red. Red was don't give them any of these at all. Green, he can take thing. And they give you all the medicines you can take and all you can. Two of them they gave me, they weren't, but it was the only readily available thing. And um, so I, I had those and I, it's like it's that that's the one thing that isn't really a stigma is you you literally wait for that next point of when your medicine is ready you wait for that and um it's tough because like I wasn't dependent on it but at the same time I was so um you know, like I said, go, seeing him, seeing a guy try to kill himself while you're trying to grab your medicine is is out of control. Right. And people talking to themselves and people, you know, like drawing in crayons and shit. And like, you know, the one thing that I will never forget was I had the interview with the doctor and the coordinator and my wife was there and my wife was kind of the one to decide from them if it was OK for me to go. And my wife said no. But the amazing thing was, even in my state that I was in, I wasn't, I wasn't in, not in, I was in touch with reality, but I still kind of wasn't. So I remember her being there and telling me, telling them no. And the reason was because she knew I was lying. She just knew that I just want to get the hell out of there. And, um, uh yeah it was long and it was tough um there was a lot of terrible things you see in there there's a lot of personalities like bipolar or somebody like everybody has a story but i never judge people but it was some horrible things you see in there i won't lie i i, I caught one that was kind of rough and kind of good at the same time and i basically waited for one um therapy class at night where it was a group group meeting where the other ones were kind of just non-essential to me. So um, after that, once I got out, um, there was some little things like, you know, PTSD kind of thing, seeing the shit I saw in there. And, you know, I had my, oh, I won't lie. I had like, uh, it went from like, it was a progression of slowly going down from crime, like once, like once a week, then once a month, and then it stopped mostly. And um, before that, I was trying to do therapy, but the therapy was not working because I was in such a crisis. Yeah. But um, the therapy helps out a lot. It still does today. I go every, I do every two weeks and it's something that'll keep you open-minded and it gives you closure. So, I I totally say that both work, but you yourself have to put in the work. Absolutely. Outpatient ones, I um I, I don't appreciate them because they're they're um all sorts of subjects that don't pertain to anything. Like um oh, yeah. girls telling girls telling me about their suicides, and I told the teacher, listen. If you don't, if you don't, if you bring the subject up again, I'm leaving. They did. So um, some outpatient doesn't work. A lot of it is uh, drug addiction, stuff like that. Um, there's no, that's the problem too, is there's no definitive mental health one. Um, it's more about suicides and stuff like that. And, you know, I don't, I, that doesn't bother me, but it didn't pertain to me at the time. And it was something that, you know, triggered the memories of the guy trying to you know hurt himself in the inpatient even if it was with a plastic knife too so i was like holy shit like what am i seeing right now you know it's it's interesting you brought up the outpatient thing because i think i've told this story uh maybe once or twice on the podcast um but i'll share with you as well um 
when I was 14, that was my first, you know, uh, attempt at trying to terminate my life, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, had the means to do it. It was in high school and my uh, mother decided it was uh, the best decision to put me in outpatient therapy, the most uh, useless and pointless uh, thing I've ever done in my entire life. The, Absolutely. The lady that was there that I was seeing, uh, she specialized in gambling addictions, had nothing to do with what I was going through, nothing at all. I didn't feel comfortable sharing what I was going through, what I what I attempted, like nothing. And I didn't start seeing a therapist or anything till I was 28. So 14 years of holding that shit in mm, was was yeah. awful. And it's it's great that you mentioned that therapy isn't for a crisis situation. And and I feel people need to like imprint that in their minds because like you said you got to put in the work for therapy but therapy is when you're ready for therapy you're at that point of okay i know what i want to heal i know what i want better in my life and i know what steps i want to take but i need somebody to help me with a blueprint versus inpatient therapy which is you know for a crisis situation like you were saying and they're there to Mm -hmm. make sure that one you're not a, a danger to yourself and two that they can, uh, you know, hopefully calm your state of mind down. And I wish I would have gone to inpatient therapy when I was a kid, because it was never something that was ever even thought of. And there was that stigma around being a, being a teenage guy, um, uh, not t- sharing how we felt, you know, um, but I, I'm so glad you brought up the inpatient outpatient uh, thing because it's something I never hear from anybody is outpatient therapy experience. Because yeah, I'm really that's, happy. You brought yeah, that. that that's what that's what they suggest to you. So I did do that, but I was uncomfortable. It was a it was a um people just coming out of uh hospitals like really really bad ones of like people screaming all night and day and bringing that up and and just shit you don't want to hear after you just got 10 days out of a um after out of uh inpatient program and it's not it's that's what people need to understand too it's not a fucking insane asylum or nothing like that it's a place for you to pretty much detox yourself from the world and calm yourself down really and um, the one thing that really, really sucked, and 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 it was um, some I did I stopped for a second was after effect. So being on the wrong pills and being on a pill that did not work and was supposed to help, um, there was two of them. So I had to medically withdraw from two. So so the difference was between that is you know withdrawing from like something like heroin or something is something that you are withdrawing by kind of by yourself honestly and um medically withdrawing is you still have to take the pills to lower yourself so bad and they take usually a month so you think about it two pills so one month of of that and then one month of that it was literally the worst time in my life uh, that it was a point it wasn't suicide but I was like I, I felt like I was gonna die because it was so hard and so painful and your my emotions were going all over the place it, it was one of the nuttiest saddest craziest times of my life and um, honestly I can't thank my mother enough for having me at her home and my father for being there for me at home Um And it was hard. The one thing um, that never happens is my dad's just kind of a stone cold guy. And he said he visited me one time there and I was in rough shape. And I was told that he got upset and left and cried in the car. Take that, take that stuff because the the internet it is bullshit everybody has a different thing in their life that it doesn't so um yeah 
so I am where I am today with with uh, my you know circle, my um, uh, family friends. So it, it's I got a pretty good um, circle, and it helps for sure. Yeah, it's it's definitely important to surround yourself with people that uh, you know hold you accountable and also lift you up at the same time, man. So it's great yeah, to see where you're at uh, at now compared to where you were maybe like 10 years ago, you know? Um, yeah. Um, 2000, yeah. 2018 to now. I mean, I'm, I'm happier than I ever could be. And, you know, it's, it, it's still an everyday thing. It don't go away. Yeah. That's what people need to realize too. That shit don't go away. Exactly. Uh, with your current platform, uh, do you ever cover mental health um, with sports or athletes? Um, I actually have had one that I know I I didn't really. Well, there was one where I um, had an interview with a hockey player that was um, both abusing alcohol and um, drugs. And also he was sexually abused as a hockey player. He was a um, national, ho- national hockey league player. He won a Stanley cup, all that stuff. And the burden of what happened to him at a younger age was really something that deal- he deals with mental health, but he also uh, advocates and has a, a program up in Canada um, to help with, with mental health. And he's trying everything he can do to do that. Um, had some people with bipolar, um, depression, all that stuff. So I can relate. So yes, I've had a few athletes in, in that, in that, uh, realm. Um, I definitely feel there's a really big stigma around athletes as well. Cause again, it, they're, they're given that chirp in the back of their head where you're not supposed to talk about this because you make X amount of money or your status as a celebrity. So it's good to see people taking those steps to advocate for others going through what they went through. So that's really cool that you have that platform for, uh, for others as well. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely helps help. Definitely helps me that, that I can help them. Yeah, for sure. Um, what made you want to join in the podcast world? Was it uh, about this? And, um, and what was it about sports that made you want to cover uh, that on your podcast? Um, so around March, I kind of just, this was kind of, you know, being a, not really in a pissed off mode, but, um, it was around March, like midway through March when the pandemic happened. Um, and I kind of wrote a thing on my, on my Instagram. And I think I said, should I start a podcast? And I got a vote that said, no. And I said, oh, really? So um, April April of 2020, I started. Um, I have a big support group with that, too. There's a bunch of shows that collab, collab together. Um, mine, I've so currently I'm in the pre- I'm living in the present. I'm still going with the with the show. And um, it's brought me to meet a lot of great people. You know, and that the the networking aspect of podcasting is phenomenal um i've had guests on here who work for nami i've had people who are uh energy healers like it's it's cool to see so many people that are involved in you know whatever they're passionate about you know like mental health is my passion and it started out with the the facebook group that i didn't know was going to blow up and one day i just decided i'm like maybe I should turn this into a podcast and see where it goes. And, you know, you reaching out to me, people on TikTok reaching out to me, like it's crazy, like where social Mm -hmm. media is right now and how many people you meet um, that are just as passionate about this as you are. Yeah. And, um, you know, finding people that have the same appreciation for the, um, the podcast world is amazing. You meet a lot of people. You could be talking about knitting. If you like talking about talking with somebody about stuff like that, 
you can talk about it or you know like this right now or collabins you know not particularly sports but mental health you know so um this is a big step for me to to you know let people know like i have my story but you know what like i have it but i'll help you know it you know so it's good it's good to you know collab instead of oh i want the joe rogan numbers i don't believe <laughs> yeah. in that sh- i don't believe in that shit and that you know that's the most important part too because I remember when I was doing a wrestling podcast, cause I'm a really big wrestling fan since I was like a kid. And when I first started doing that podcast, it was like around the same time everybody else was doing podcasts. I wasn't seeing any numbers on my channel, you know, anything over 10, I'd be lucky or, you know, whatever. And I got discouraged and I kind of was in that mindset. I'm like, well, shit, I'm not getting anywhere near 20 views. What's the point of doing this? Uh, that was like, 2018 2017 around there fast forward to now and now i have that mentality you do where it's like i don't need this amount of people i just want to reach whoever i can reach if they love my stuff great if not that's fine too and i feel that's one of the most important parts of doing this podcast is knowing what you want to talk about and keeping it consistent so it's cool to see that uh there's somebody else that has that mentality as well well, that's the thing is people look at these numbers, man. And I'm like, okay, so that interview has 48, okay? And then this one has 5,400 views. Those are just numbers on your computer. What are those numbers doing for you realistically? Right. You know, it's just like, if you don't have a passion for it, don't. It's like people saying they have a million views on one thing they just started. Okay, congratulations. It's just a number to me. So people just need to really look at like, this takes a lot of work. It It's not like you just grab a microphone and, and shit like that. You need a lot of steps to get into this game. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've loved every single second of it. Me too. And it's, it's a, it's been a great and positive experience. You know, uh, when I first started this podcast, you know, like I said, it was just kind of one of those, the group got to a certain number and I was like, okay, I think it's time to branch out. Um, when I shared it with my therapist, I'm like, Hey, like, you know, I started this podcast and everything. And she said that she wanted to listen to it, hearing a professional in the mental health field, praise what you're doing. Uh, you know, compared to when you started therapy is crazy to me. Like tomorrow will be two years that I started uh, this journey with my therapist. And, you know, two years from when I started to right now has been the most surreal experience of my life. You know, I've, I've done and I've mm. experienced so many things that I would have never experienced before therapy, you know, and the mental health mm-hmm. community is growing more and more every single day and being part of this and being able to give a platform for people to share their story like yourself is probably one of the best feelings I've ever experienced in my life. Absolutely. And, you know, it's the people you meet every time you have an interview. Like I've talked to Super Bowl champions, Stanley Cup champions, uh, professional pole vaulters in the Olympics. Like it it just it's amazing. I've seen people that have gone to the UFC and I just talk with them. So it's um, it's amazing. And but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Just I, I don't care if you're a high school football star. Like it, it it doesn't matter to me. The audience can be or people can be on my show. I'm not I'm not a person that's like, no, I don't want you. So it's 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 the gr- gratification of making yourself happy, not not any other person making yourself happy. If you're happy with your podcast, keep going. Absolutely. Um I didn't write this question down, but just to kind of bounce off of the original question. um, Have you ever tried to collaborate with a other podcaster who was maybe bigger and they kind of just like gave you the snooty reply like, oh, well, I don't want to step down kind of attitude and be on your podcast. Have you ever experienced that before? Um, Yes, I have. Um, I was trying to deal with, uh, 
um, in Alabama, they pretty much told me you're too low in numbers. Um, where another case where I've had um, an interview that I was going to post and they said, are we done yet? In the middle of the interview. So I said, I'm not even going to post this. I've never really had a bad experience with the podcast besides that, that, and um, uh, yeah, basically those two. I mean, everybody else has been perfectly fine. I mean, I, I respect and like, some people have no answer because they're so busy or they're contracted by somebody in the sports world. There's a lot of contracts and different, they're owned by uh, radio stations and stuff like that. So um, that I don't mind, but other than that, I really haven't had a problem. That's crazy. You had somebody in the middle of an interview say that, are we done yet? Like I can't even like process that. That's crazy to me. I I was just like, I don't care if you, whatever you have done with your career, which I, I'm not going to say who it was, but they said, are we done yet? And wow. I, I'm done and I'll never, that was erased from my t- computer. So yeah. it's over with that now. And, and, you know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, you have the same passion about whatever sport that that person does, or in my case, I have the passion about mental health and so many of these people in this community or just any, any community really where they look at them like, Oh, well, they don't get as many viewers as me. So I can't step down and, you know, help the little guy or help them spread the message. I just, I don't understand that mentality. I I really can't understand why people claim they support a message, but don't want to, help spread the message you know what i mean yeah like i made a tiktok i said you know if uh false stuff right i i made a tiktok where i said you know if you charge money for an interview that's fine i have no problem paying money for an interview but you know you don't have to be snooty about it like no sorry i can't like how hard is that sentence you know what i mean yeah, I, I, I've I had the luxury of not having to pay one for three years, but a, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it can be kind of rough around the edges if, um, if you have negative people and I really never have negative people on my show. Yeah. Yeah. And that's well, except for the, except for the one. Right. Um, so the next question I had uh, written down for you was, uh, so given your experience uh, from therapy before, how would you say therapy feels now that your mind isn't clouded with, uh, I guess, so much darkness uh, like like it was in 2018? So I will say one thing before that. So around the time when that girl was, was saying she should kill herself and all that stuff, I had a therapist at that time. And a month after, he says to me, um, why don't you go across the street and just look at her house? And I go, you're not my therapist anymore. And I was like, that is the most bizarre therapy. Uh, I I have no idea what that was. But it that was a darker, uh, darker cloud on me than than it was at the time to say, Hey, go to this girl's house and look across the street. Like, yeah. Okay. But so going off from (laughs) that. um, Yes. After. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So um, with that in the, so now that I'm not clouded with darkness per se, um, therapy has been a a really great thing. Um, It it's kind of like a, um, like a drain kind of thing. Like it drains like the negative stuff you may have had in two weeks. You may not have, but it like, it's like flushes it out and it lets you speak your mind about how you're feeling. So, um, therapy is a great thing. It's not a, it, it's not like, uh, how do I say it? It's not like Tony Soprano where you're, you know, you know, you, you can't fucking tell me what to do, blah. And, um, it's just, uh, it, it, you, and that's the thing too. That's another thing. If you're trying to go to therapy, 
you can't just pick the first one. The first one might suck. The second one might suck. You need to find the one that's for you and for you. It doesn't matter. Like you have to find that one because if you stick with one and they suck, like you're, there's nothing that's going to help you or get anything accomplished for you. So that's my advice to anybody in that because it took me a while and I found it and I'm sticking to it. You know, Better. I've always said that. 2018. Yeah, I've always said that. You know, uh, maybe you know the the several therapists that you may or may not go through might be for different stages of your life too. You know, uh, uh, the first therapist might be for you know when your parents got divorced. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the second one could have been like your childhood trauma, and you know. So I, I don't think uh, having multiple therapists is, is necessarily a bad thing at all. No, not at all. Um, but I'm saying it along the lines of like, you see, if, if you just meet a therapist, you sign up to see one and you don't like them, you don't have to stay with them. You don't have this binding contract. Just find another one yeah. until you feel comfortable. Right. That's a problem with people too. They give up on that. So. Yeah, yeah, the the giving up thing is very real too, man, cuz when I moved back to Florida from New Jersey, uh I gave up on therapy after I found one because it was such a shitty experience for me. Um and I think I waited about 2 years when I got insurance again to actually get the therapist I have now. So, uh you know, I I'm on the same exact page as you with, you know, don't settle on one therapist regardless of the experience you know, ask questions, you know, ask them what mm -hmm. they specialize in and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I have to say, I found the perfect one in, um, a lot of good lessons. Um, like for me, it's like, I'm judgmental sometimes. So I'm, I'm assuming somebody's talking shit or I'm assuming like, you know, like, like, Oh, he, he, he probably fucks and fucks around at work and he doesn't do anything that's my problem but she always everything like you yeah. can't assume because it's not you you're not the one saying it or doing the things you don't see it you don't hear it like just stop with that and um like i said therapy is a great thing yeah probably can't probably knock it till you try it yeah I, I always like to say therapy isn't for everybody but if for the people who are open-minded to it, it may or may not be the best experience of your life. No, I had a really messed up one. <laughs> that guy was fucking weird. He was like from the Game of Thrones era. <laughs> talking about like, oh, well, the queens and things, they were all doing these crazy things. And I'm like, all right, like this is the wrong therapy. I'm not in medieval <laughs> times. Thank you. Jesus. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. That's that's a lesson for all you people. Don't pick those type of therapists. Pick the ones that are for you. Right. Yeah. And, and uh also to bounce off of that as well. Um, you know, I, I said it in my last podcast, but I'll say it again. Um, if you feel like therapy is, you know, you've done it enough to where you you're not optimistic about it anymore, you know, there's Therapy goes beyond talking to a specialist, you know, therapy could look like going to the gym and that's your therapy, you know, yeah. writing in your journal. It's not necessarily talking to a specialist. It's something that makes you happy. Therapy makes me very happy. It, like you said, it's a drain. It's hundred percent a drain. And yeah. when you find ways to start healing, life becomes so much easier for you in every single way. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it's just something that is a help to me. It may not be for somebody else, but it is to me. So exactly. Um, so this is a this is a question I, I like to ask just for this month, specifically being a suicide prevention month. Um, what does the month of September being September Prevention Month mean to you? 
and how do you feel you contribute to the mental health community? Uh, yeah. Um, so honestly, um, I, I feel the same way about mental health awareness month too, is for people dealing with suicide and for people dealing with mental health, it's not just a month. It's, it's a constant everyday thing. So yes, it's, it's a good, th it's a good thing. It's a good thing to get people aware and get people things. Um, but people need to realize that, um, yes, it's a good thing to, to appreciate the month and, and, you know, help out in the month, but this is an everyday struggle for people like a mental health, uh, awareness month, mental health is me every day. Yeah. So, um, you know, but I do support, support those things. Um, I, I had, um, a family member who, um, was very sick, had a lot of demons and had, had a big battle with that and, um, was just casually, um, having a drink in the meds that he was or the i don't know i don't know what it exactly was did not combine good with just a regular alcoholic drink and he actually ac accidentally died in in his sleep so it is tough it's 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 stuff you find in your family that it hurts and it hurts outside your family too when you hear about somebody wanting to take their life it's a very hard thing because you like I hear from different perspectives and I hear it, you know, like, you know, they were going through demons or they, in somebody's mind, you don't know what they're going through. And on, on another standpoint, you got to, I consider an asshole saying, oh, well, you know, he was an asshole for taking his own life. Well, honestly, you don't know what that person was going through. Exactly. So I, I, I don't like that, but I do support the months. I just feel like it needs to be like people need to know that people go through this struggle every day, not just a month. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you on that hundred percent, man. Like I think a couple months ago, I'd maybe say three or four months ago, um, it was mental health awareness month. I believe that that is in May, June or May. I don't remember. I might be getting my months mixed up and we were talking on a podcast about the whole thing saying, you know, it's great that things are have their own month and that there's certain topics that we're talking about throughout every month. But like you said, there is something about mental health where it needs to be talked about every single day, not just, Oh, well, it's September. Let's talk about it. Now people die every single day. You know, people mm -hmm. uh, suffer from mental health struggles every single day. And you know, whether that's veterans, whether that's teachers, whether that's podcasters like you and I, like it happens to everybody. Right. And, and I always try to tell people, I'm like, you know, don't ever think that something can't happen to you because life will humble you really fast. And that's why I feel mental health should be talked about every single day because, you know, you could have a family member overdose, you know, or whatever, uh, whatever else they're dealing with tomorrow it can happen to you so right it's great having a month i i support it 100 percent. but like you said it should be talked about every single day not just stuck to a month right because people struggle with it every day not just not just a month right exactly um so this is a good question I had written down for you, uh, you know, being being a guy like yourself and myself, you know, we have that big stigma around being a man. We're supposed to be the man. We're supposed to be <laughs> the rock of the family, the provider and never talk about what you're going through. Do you feel there's a stigma when it comes to uh, men's mental health? And have you ever experienced it firsthand? Um. Yes. Um, c considering the fact of somebody was with me and they kind of had, I don't want to say, a well, yeah, I'll say a breakdown. And um, 
you know, maybe you should go see somebody like a therapist or something if the lot's on your mind. No, I'm too, I'm too this, you know what I mean? Like I'm too strong for that. And I'm supposed to make an example because I'm the man or whatever. Um, to me, um, now what I went through, um, I wa that was a time where anger came back too, was after the fact of all that happening. And I kind of was like, um, when I came back to work and I said to people, um, I didn't tell them what happened and all that stuff, but I was like, it's none of your business and you have no fucking clue what I went through. Like no idea. And I, that was the, the, the part in me that I was like, you want to be a man, try doing what the fuck I did all that time, you know, um, sorry for swearing, but, no, it's um, perfectly fine, man. yeah, like all through that, like, but yeah, like through all that, um, yeah, I think men have it. it it's, 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 um, it's, it's basically like, like what mental health is like a long, for a long time, mental health was just taboo. And so is, uh, men being, or, younger adults being um you know you know wusses or you know whatever like shit happens and it's like you know it's something where like it needs to be like hey it's not just men i meant women it's just, it's men too and and women have it just as bad i've i saw it when i was in an inpatient i saw guys who thought they still had their cat and the cat was dead for like 10 years. He was still looking for the cat. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, obviously there's a stigma that, you know, there's, there's men with mental health. Like, yeah, I've seen guys walking around drinking coffee back and forth, talking to themselves. Like, of course, like it is a, it is a stigma. And unfortunately I had to like see some different aspect of it that a nor like I call it normal normal type of guys like us that would never see such a thing um but in actuality yeah it, it is a stigma and you know i have experienced it firsthand yeah and you know we, we see the numbers the the numbers don't lie about that at all man like no. the suicide number or uh, the suicide rate for men is significantly high uh you know with social media and the expectations of men and they're supposed to be the rock and providers of, of the family and everything, man. And then all of a sudden when they're not that rock, when they're not as strong as they're supposed to be the, you know, a divorce happens, they lose the kids and then they fall deeper into that hole. And society is just like, Oh, well, so-and-so was happy this day. Like I'll use him as an example every single time. Chester Bennington of Lincoln park. Yes. Post they posted a picture of him with his family where he looked really happy, smiling, hanging out with all his friends and his kids and his wife. And then he took his life. You don't know what somebody is going through, male or female. No. Right. Exactly. That I was will never say my trauma outweighs anybody else's trauma. But as a man, I can tell you we have it. Our, the stigma around men is a lot uh, thicker than it is around women, you know, cause, and that's how society portrays it because it's true. You know, the mental health should be every day. Every day should be talked about. Like, like we said last um, few minutes ago and men's mental health is something that has become more apparent and still not talked about. Look at veterans. Veterans is probably one of the best examples of struggling with mental health. And a lot of those veterans are men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll, we'll get to that part of this podcast towards the end. But yeah, man, like the stigma around men is, is insane. And also the, you know, when I was in inpatient, there was a, I would say she was an older, like, or no, like a, a younger college girl who, was supposedly addicted to weed and people were judging her saying oh well she doesn't deserve to be in here she shouldn't have to be here it's like well what the fuck is the qualifications for being in here like the girl's just trying to better herself like other people have mental issues so it's 
it, it doesn't it happens with women too so i wouldn't i'm not just going to stick it to like what men go through but women do have it too so absolutely yeah for sure man um so we've reached uh the last question here that i am really happy that you uh brought to my attention um because it'll bring me into my part of it as well but you mentioned your shirt and how it has a significant meaning meaning for you and for the mental health community. Can you share with us the meaning and the significance of uh, your apparel? So this is uh, called Kill Combat Gear. Um, it was created by a MMA fighter Sean Lally. He's a good dude. Um, works with the works with everything. Works with the Bruins. Works with stuff like that and. I'll just read his mission statement was is to assist humans in killing their demons in all forms. We are here to destroy negativity, fear, and anything that does not allow you to grow, which I believe because he's done so much for domestic violence, like every single possible thing, mental health, all that stuff. He's even reached out to me. I said, I'm going to wear your stuff on, on the show. And he said, absolutely kind of need to bring these stories out. So appreciate sean lally and his his um his brand yeah man. Uh, thank you uh about respect thank you for sharing that with us because uh i think it's it's important to you know it's not just the shirt to you and i it's not just this looks cool so i'm gonna buy it it has meaning behind it like uh, a couple weeks ago i was wearing a shirt um from Stayware. you know they're a mental health uh platform as well who sells shirts uh tries to get the message out there for suicide awareness and on the back of it it says trying not to fall apart and it repeats that line uh at least 30 times but with every line it turns into like an anxiety look and towards the end it says you know you don't have to fight this battle alone and uh contact uh this number if you're going through a crisis and somebody's like oh my god oh. you paid you paid x amount of money on this shirt like why would you do that? And I pulled him aside. And I said, listen, like this shirt has meaning behind it. It's not just the shirt. And, you know, um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's cool that it's not just something to wear to look fancy or anything. It has great meaning, which brings me to the shirt that I'm wearing. Um, this is for the Till Valhalla project who works with the, you know, veteran mental health awareness i have a shirt as well actually i have uh the mental health awareness one with the green american flag behind it too nice. so i respect that brand too yeah um i have the one that has stay so, on the front of it it's definitely a good cause yeah it's an incredible cause um i have this one that i'm wearing now that says stay uh you're needed tomorrow and on the back of it, it mentions what a semicolon is. You know, that's used to end a sentence, but basically reiterates on the bottom, your story is not over. So it's Love suicide it. awareness. And it's also, you know, a little literature grammar thing too. So um, I have a quote here that I wanted to read from them, a uh, card. So like a base, basically a thank you card from them. Um, and this is from Corey Schaefer, who is the founder of the Till Valhalla Project. Um, a hero never truly dies until the last time their name is spoken and continue to honor them and they will live on forever. And they give you a little bracelet, too, if you decide to purchase it, where it says 22 a day with the stars from the flag, uh, you know, significant uh, signifying the amount of veterans that commit suicide every day really high number i mean i wish that was zero but again like you and i spoke about man every single day it needs to be talked about not just right. a month um where can everybody find you on your socials yeah so so my socials are instagram at Maddie C23. I have another one, but I mainly use that one hundred percent. You'll find my sports stuff, uh, different quotes, whatever you need. Um, on Facebook, it's just Matt Cameron. Uh, Twitter, which I also don't really use, is Maddie23. So basically, just go on um, 
maddie c23 on instagram shoot me a message or whatever you need to do um also um occasionally i um i'm on my facebook with matt cameron and you can message me on that too and i'm sure you can get the resources to that too yeah i'll make sure to post everything on the podcast description as well excellent um before we end today's podcast i just want to give you another uh shout out and a big thank you for doing this podcast. It definitely means a lot to me. Um, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners will appreciate it as well. Um, this podcast will drop next Tuesday. So the 27th, I believe that falls on. And, uh, I have one more quote I wanted to read to you guys. I uh, felt like this was a really meaningful, um, podcast or a quote for this podcast. This one is from, uh, Nikki, uh, Bannis, I, I apologize if I just butchered that name, but you never really know the true impact you have on those around you. You never know how much someone needed that smile you gave them. You never know how much kindness turned someone's entire life around. You never know how much someone needed that long hug or deep talk. So, do not, uh, so don't wait to be kind. Don't wait for someone else to be the kind for, to be kind first. Don't wait for better circumstances or for someone to change. Just be kind because you never know how much someone needs it. Like me and you said, man, you never know what somebody else is going through. I thought it was incredible uh, to read for the end of this podcast. Thank you again. Um, I will make sure to send this episode to you as soon as it drops. And I'll say to everybody on here, which I'll I'll make you remember again is the past is depression, the future is anxiety, live in the present. Incredible. I love it. (laughs) I'm going to get that from you as soon as we end this podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And yeah, if anybody wants to shoot me a message, by all means. Definitely, man. Uh, For all my listeners, thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, This will be on Spotify and YouTube when I post it. And always remember, be gentle with yourselves and be well. Thank you for listening. Take care.